shining at the sun. No last days to sing His Watching over me, my Lord, all night and all day. Angels watching over me.
So uh, thank you NDA administrators and teachers and all that who come. We really appreciate that. Um, there's a couple of little things. You know, we've got a lunch coming up today, and we want to make sure that everybody is clear. Can you get me to the correct one? Uh, we want to make sure that everybody's clear on the, uh, on the lunch. Young people and anybody else who wants to, we're going to be serving lunch outside today. That's kind of nice, isn't it? And then if you really need to be inside, you have allergies or something, then you can, uh, you can sit inside. Otherwise, we're going to sit outside. I wanted to share a little something that happened this week that was kind of important to us here at Mosaic. If you're a guest, bear with us. Um, can you get me back to the start? And I'll try not to touch it this time. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and we're having a little problem with our video card. Can you tell? We've gone crazy pink on this one. But that's right. It's Mother's Day. So uh, this week we had a little meeting. Uh, I don't know. Most of you may know that the fellow that lives next door is an NBA uh, veteran. And he, plays, uh, he played basketball for the Miami Heat for a little while. And now he's a coach of uh, young kids. And uh, they came to us this week and they asked us if, uh, if we wouldn't mind, since we have all this real estate here, if they built us a great big gymnasium on our property. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is that many's the slip between the cup and the lip. And just because somebody says they want to do that and they say money's no problem doesn't always mean that they really want to do that and money's no problem. So if you would please make that a matter of prayer, what they would want is a shared facility where they can teach young kids about the Christian way to play basketball. And then we would get a family life center that we could all use. And right now, they're talking about three side-by-side -side volleyball courts in 22,000 square feet. <laughs> so if y'all would pray about that, I think that would be really good. If y'all would keep that a subject of prayer. And our guests can do that too because, you know, we'll invite you to come and use it. And they said they might even air condition it, which would be nice. Okay, and I don't know if this is going to work today or not. But if it's not, I'm going to trust you to handle it, Okay. So we want to talk about Esther. All, our friend Esther here is a, is a woman, and that's why we're talking about her today. What I've noticed about Esther as a woman is that she contrasts aggressively with the men in the story. Now, as a caveat, I don't want you to think that I think all women have Esther's qualities, because I've known some bad women, and the Bible even talks about some bad women. And on Mother's Day, you're not supposed to say there are bad women, but there are bad women. Jezebel. And on the other side, there are some good men. And so I don't want you to know just because I'm telling a story about Haman and the king that, there, that all the men are bad. Now, first let me address the big issue with the book of Ruth, I mean of, of Esther. Everybody says there's a problem with Esther. Esther doesn't what? Mention God. Everybody wants to bring that up. And okay, let's, let's cover that right at first. Look at Esther, read Esther, read it through several times, and you will realize that Esther was not written as a part of the canon. Esther was written as Medo Persian history. It was written to go into the Medo Persian history book, and so it was sanitized. We think probably Mordecai or one of his friends wrote the book, and we don't really know for sure, but whoever wrote it wrote it to be a history of Medo Persia, and so they left it out. But as we go through, you're going to see that we actually do have a mention of God and prayer in it. It just is not overt because it was written to be in a sanitized, secular place. So here's the story. You remember, along comes the king, and he has a queen named Vashti. Now, old Vashti, the Jewish Mizra writers, Midrash writers, like to pick on Vashti and make her a bad character in this. But I don't make her a bad character, and if you read Esther carefully, there's nothing there to say that she was a bad character. So here's what happens. He has this big ego fest. The king, who we call Ahasuerus in this book, who's actually probably Xerxes I, has a great big, uh, a great big ego fest. For six months, he invites all of the soldiers, all the army, and all the men to come to Susa and be his guests for partying and enjoyment. Now, 
historians feel like probably what's happening here is he was marshalling the troops to send them up against the Ptolemaic states in the northern of the Mediterranean to, to defeat the Egyptians, which happened soon after this. So that's probably what was happening. So he marshals up all of his troops. He treats them wonderfully for 180 days. And at the end of 180 days, he has a seven-day festival. And this seven-day festival at the end of the 180 days, he gets really smashed. And he is absolutely wasted. And as he's wasted at this party, what's happening on the other side of the palace? Our friend Vashti is having another party. You can kind of see it in the gray writing at the top of the screen. It says, at the same time, Queen Vashti gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. Okay, fellas, now... Think about this. You're having a stag party, and at the same time, your wife is having a lady's tea. Okay? It says that while he was smashed, he sent a bunch of eunuchs over to the lady's side, and he said, can you please come over and do the dance of the seven veils for my buddies? And what would your wife say? Anybody got any thoughts? On, no, I don't, you can't repeat it in church. But what would your wife say, right? Your wife would say not no, right? Absolutely no. And that's exactly what Vashti said. And so I don't see in this writing, I don't see putting all this bad stuff on Vashti for saying no. Um, there's speculation. It doesn't say she was only to wear the crown and that she was to come naked except for the crown. But it's a stag party. He was the king. I think we can maybe make that assumption. But, I mean, if you were drunk and you had absolute power, maybe you'd do that too, guys. I don't know. So he invited her. She said no. And then what happened is he got steamed. And he got really upset. When they convened the court, she refused to come. This made the king what? Furious. All right? Furious. So he is furious. And so the first thing we notice in the book of Esther, the story of Esther tells about men who, when things don't go their way, get furious. It happens over and over in this book. It's a recurrent theme. And so our first manly attribute in the book of Esther is rage. Rage. People rage. Men rage in Esther. And we'll see the king do it and we'll see Haman do it. They rage. I don't know about you. Have you all ever had a real problem losing your temper? See, it's not a real recurrent pro this week. Yes? Um, it's not a real recurrent problem for me. I mean, I don't lose my temper a lot. I know people who do. I've told you about that guy that I represented his wife, and his big anger thing was he would always grab a door in the house, and he would shake it until he'd break the hinges. You know, the screws that hold the hinges on would get loose. So all the doors in his house were kind of lopsided and hickey-jawed. Hickey-jawed, is that a word? How do you spell hickey-jawed? It's a word now, okay. So he used to always shake all the doors. Well, different people do different things when they're angry. I don't know what you do. You know, for me, getting, losing my temper comes in two stages. The first stage is the sputtering stage. Has anybody ever gotten to the sputtering stage? You, not this week. I mean, just any time, you know. If you've got to, and it's like, what you do? I, I, how did, why, when, who, when, when, if you, what? And that's the sputtering stage. And, and for me, that's a pretty good stage because nobody gets hurt, you know. <laughs> and then there's the other stage, the stage when I just physically can't speak, right? That's really bad. Now, what always happens when you lose your temper? We used to always have a saying when we were trying cases, and it said, lose your temper, lose the jury. If you lose your temper, the jury sees it, and they go, hmm. And you know why? Because the Bible says that the fruit of the Spirit includes self-control. And when people see us lose self-control, they lose respect. And guess what? It works that way for me too. The first thing that ever happens whenever I recover myself after losing my temper is I am so ashamed of myself. How about you? 
my goodness, I lost my temper. How could I have done that? I said things I shouldn't have said. I thought things I certainly, well, I think all the time. And I, I mean, it was bad, right? And so you lose your temper and it's a bad thing. And I get so ashamed. What makes you lose your temper? What makes you rage? Different things for different people and different outcomes for different people. You know, I get to the point that I can't speak. Some people hit people. Some people break stuff. Some people are throwers. Anybody ever? I'm not going to raise your hand. And you throw things. Throw things. Very dangerous. You can hurt things. You can hurt people. I had a client one time whose husband threw her puppy broke its little leg on the wall so sad don't throw puppies kittens you can throw kittens but not puppies okay so okay don't throw kittens either kids I didn't mean it so different things happen what makes you upset what really gets you in a rage I'll tell you what gets me in a rage number one thing that gets me in a rage is when frustration goes on and on and on until it's just too much Frustration overflowing brings rage. The second thing is when somebody does something that you know that they know that just drives you nuts and they keep doing it, right? And the third thing is when somebody calls you out and they're right. <sighs> Don't you hate that? You know, you're having a fight with somebody and they make a really good point and they're right. There's an old Dostoevsky line that's really interesting. It says, uh, it's, in, it's in the book, The Brothers Karamazov. You know, Dostoevsky was a Christian. And he said, he longed, talking about a character, he longed to revenge himself on everyone for his own shortcomings. Isn't that classic? He longed to revenge himself on everyone for his own shortcomings. He suddenly recalled how he had once been asked, why do you hate so-and-so so much? And he answered in his own shameless way, I'll tell you, he's done, no me, he's done me no harm, but I played him a dirty trick, and ever since then I've hated him. Isn't that, isn't that the truth? We decide to hate somebody, we get mad at somebody, and we just do. Did you hear this week in the news, it just came out yesterday, big headline in Florida? Lady was mad at her neighbor, bulldozer working in the neighborhood. She told the, the bulldozer guy, that's my house there. Would you please plow it down? And while you're at it, make sure you dig up the septic system. So the bulldozer starts to knock the house down. And the people come home. Please came, it ended badly. But anyway, uh, the point is people, people get this rage going, right? And they do the most insane things. There is a, a 2012 story. The headline is, Man Murders Former Classmate. Well, okay, I can see that, maybe. June 2012, Carl Erickson, a 73-year-old South Dakota man, was sentenced to life in prison after admitting to the murder of a former high school classmate. Friends and family members were shocked. This is a true story. This is not from The Onion. This, is, this really happened. Friends and family members were shocked that the once successful insurance salesman seemed to snap. Erickson had been married to his wife for 44 years. After the murder, his secret finally came out for 50 years. He had simmered with a belated grudge. He was still mad about a classmate who once pulled a jock strap over his head during a high school locker room prank. After holding the grudge for 50 years, Carl rang Johnson's doorbell and shot him to death. You know, we think that we're past that because we live in North America in the 21st century, right? Right? And hardly anybody does that, right, except Eric, Erickson, this guy, Carl. But we live in a dangerous world. Has anybody looked at the news lately? Did you see in the Sudan, in the last couple of weeks, they've killed several thousand people just over some sort of a political disagreement? They're attempting a new suicide, uh, I mean, a new genocide in Sudan. Iraq has declined back into war, and the Ukraine is at war. There are danger spots all over the world where people kill each other for the minorest of causes. Rage is a problem, and if you have a rage problem, 
I have the solution for you. See, the problem with rage is rage is all about me. You notice that? Rage is all about me. I'm not mad at you. I'm mad at me. I'm mad at what you did to me. I'm mad about how I feel about what you did to me. I'm mad about me. And we have to get past rage by getting past me. And that's the way out of rage. So there's one other story, and I, I won't read it to you. It's a really, anybody here ever watched that story, uh, Laura and Mary and the Little House on the Prairie on TV? Remember that Nellie girl? So it turns out Nellie is an adult actress now because it's been 30 years, right? Believe it or not. For those of you who think you're young, it was 30 years ago. And so Nellie goes and signs autographs. And Nellie's signing autographs. And while she's signing autographs, a woman walks up to her who's purple in the face. And she looks at her. And she barely stammers out, I forgive you, and ran away. She'd been holding a grudge that turned her purple for 30 years, and it never even happened. It was fictional. And she'd been holding a grudge against the actress that played Nellie for 30 years. True story. Nellie says in an interview, it happens all the time. People come to this actress and tell her how mad they are about what she did in an acting role on TV 30 years ago. We hold grudges for the most insane reasons and for the most insane periods of time. So here is the rage. And what does rage do next? He calls in all of his advisors and he says, what shall I do? And the advisor says, if you let her get away with this, women all over the country are going to treat their husbands badly. Read the book of Esther. I mean, it's powerful. I don't have time to read you the whole book today, but I, you got to look at this. He says, oh, his advisors say, you've got to take her in hand or else all of our wives are going to be saying no to the dance of the seven bales. And so he says, okay, and he exiles her. The Midrash kind of indicates that she was executed. There's nothing in the book to indicate that she was, edu that she was. But when he exiles her, it's published and they think they have solved the problem. So here are the three things I want you to know that men do in the book of Esther. And we'll see Haman does it as well. But the three things they do. The first, they rage. And second, they ruminate. Have you ever ruminated on your rage? You know what ruminate means, right? That's what a cow does. After a cow eats that grass, a cow <sighs> brings it back up again. And chews on it a while. So you get really angry and you bring it back and then you think about it a while, right? And he talks about all of his friends and he says, what, you know, this woman just in, and they get all twisted up about it. And the third thing they do, so they first, they rage, second, they ruminate, and third, they make rules. Men love to make rules, don't they? Don't you ever do that again. You ever heard a man say that? Don't you ever do that again. Always the emphasis on ever. Maybe you could do it the other way. Don't you ever do that again. No, I don't know. It doesn't work that way. Anyway, so men make rage. They ruminate on it and they make rules. And that's exactly what happens in this book three different times. So the next thing you know, he makes this big rule. He says, he says, every woman needs to obey her husband. And now he goes out and he finds him a new queen. Now, this is one of those anomalies in the Bible. This is the place in the Bible. Kids, cover your ears where cosmetics are extolled as a virtue. I don't know. You got to read it. It says it. She wears her cosmetics and she wins the supermodel contest, believe it or not. And after winning the supermodel contest, she becomes the queen, but she's only the queen at the request of the king. She can't go into the king's house. She can't go into the king's courtyard. She'll be in trouble if she does. Haman then comes on. And Haman gets promoted. And you remember, Haman got a rule. Everybody had to bow to him. And so everybody bowed to Haman. And when they bowed to Haman, there's one guy who didn't. Does anybody know why our friend Mordecai wouldn't bow to Haman? See, this is where the book gets religious. This is code. You got to read the Jewish code. Who was Haman? Haman was an Agagite. 
What's an Agagite? An Agagite is of the king Agag, the king of the Amalekites. Do you remember the Amalekites? You got to go all the way back to Deuteronomy to the Amalekites. Can you give me the text in Deuteronomy? So we go back to Deuteronomy. We hear about the Amalekites. The Amalekites were playing dirty warfare. They were following along behind the children of Israel when they were marching through the desert, and they were picking off the weak ones. And God told the children of Israel, never forget what the Amalekites did to you as you came from Egypt. They attacked you when you were exhausted and weary, and they struck down those who were straggling behind. They had no fear of God. Therefore, when the Lord God has given you rest from all your enemies in the land that he's giving you as a special possession, you must destroy the Amalekites and erase their memory from under heaven. Never forget this. Do you think he's serious about this? Boy, this sounds really serious, doesn't it? If your mama wrote you a letter, never forget this twice, she says. I mean, I think you'd listen, right? So what did they do? Time goes on. Guess what king gets appointed to eradicate the Amalekites? Saul. Saul gets appointed to eradicate the Amalekites. Don't leave a thing living, Samuel said. Make sure that we erase their memory as God instructed us to do. And what happens? He brings back King Agag. And Samuel says, what am I hearing? I thought I said kill it. He said no. So King Agag's descendants descend right down to the period of the captivity here. This is hundreds of years later. And Haman is a descendant of King Agag. And Mordecai is not going to bow. Now, why is that part of the story important? Why is it even told here? It's told here so that you know that this is a religious book. This is a book that belongs in the history of Israel because that's the only reason they have to tell that part of the story. is so that you know that this is about the kingdom of Israel and its enemies the descendants of Esau. Remember, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. And this is Esau's descendants, the Amalekites, and a Jew will not bow to him. So Haman is so mad. It's really interesting. He's so mad that that Mordecai won't bow to him. The scripture says that he would not even dirty his hand to smack him with it. You have to be pretty raged, enraged, right? Wouldn't even dirty his hand by smacking Mordecai. He says, I've got an idea. I'm just going to commit genocide. That would be easier than dirtying myself by beating him up. And so he gets the order from the king. Rage, ruminate, rule. Right? So he gets the order from the king. And then off they go. And now Mordecai tells Esther. And what does Esther say? Esther says, look. I can't even go to the king. It's, it, it risks my whole life to go to the king. And then there's that famous line, y'all remember the Navy for such a time as this, right? And then what happens is really beautiful because the contrast between Haman and the king now shows up because here's the contrast. Instead of rage, rumination, and rule, here comes Esther, and the first thing that she does is she realizes what the reality of the situation is. She assesses the reality of it. This is life or death. I'm going to die too with my people if this happens. So she assesses reality. And so before we go any further, have you all assessed reality today? Do we know the reality of our situation before God? Do we know the reality that we are just as condemned as the children of Israel were by Haman? We are just as due, worthy, and expectant of death as Esther. So we need to acknowledge our reality. Have we done that? The next thing that she does is she does this little party thing. And this is a beautiful thing. She invites the king and Haman over to her house, two nights running for a big banquet. And she makes up a wonderful party for them. So here's a wise woman. The first thing she does is she gets in touch with reality. And the second thing she does is she begins to build relationship. See, where the men are getting enraged 
and ruminating and making rules. She's building relationship. And I want you to know that we have the unique opportunity of building a relationship with God right now. See, there are a lot of people who don't understand that, and they're out there raging, raging for so many thousands of reasons. They rage for a million reasons, and they miss the opportunity to make a relationship. And right now, today, we have the opportunity, just like Esther, to make a relationship. And the third thing she does, after she builds the relationship, she doesn't make any rules. She doesn't create any edicts. She doesn't say, this is what you need to do, king. She simply makes her situation known. She reveals her situation. She reveals her situation to the king, and she lets the king do what's right. And the king does what's right, doesn't he? He takes Haman and puts him on the, on the spike that he had prepared for his enemy Mordecai. So the question is today, right now, here today, have you realized the reality of your situation? Have you built a relationship and have you laid your revelation before God of where you stand? You know what? We always get, I always get, real wound up and I pray for a real specific thing Lord what I really need is one million dollars right now right what I really need is for this to work out this way what I really need is for that to work out that way what I really need is this and this and this and this and you know what Esther gives us a perfect example she says oh king I have been condemned to death now what are you going to do about it perhaps a better prayer for us to pray before God is, Dear Father, our life is a mess and we could think of a thousand solutions and they'd probably all be wrong. Save us and change us into the way you want us to be. Leave it in God's hands. And that's exactly what Esther does. She says, look, I need you to save me. I'm condemned to death along with all my people. Save me. And you know what the king did? pretty cool instead of the king saying I'll save you the king says well here's my signet ring Mordecai fix it he puts the power right back in their hands but she had to first ask him what if she'd have said king give Mordecai your ring he'll fix this no no that's not how you talk to a king is it she says king this is our situation this is my problem if I die I die but I prefer not to and the king says, this I can fix. And he takes care of Haman, and he gives his ring to Mordecai, and it's fixed. So the question is today, have you come to acknowledge your reality? Have you come to a relationship with the king? And have you revealed to the king where you are and what you need from him? Today, I'd like to pray for you. And if you're wanting to join in this prayer, as you hear what you want to join in, you can raise your hand. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, today right here, we have a reality that is sin and destruction, and that our hearts are ruined, and they're broken, and they're filthy. And right now, as we pray, there are some of us, there are some of us who desire and are longing for a better, greater, deeper, more wonderful relationship with you and with your spirit in our hearts. And as we pray for this, and as we desire this, and as we ask for this, what we're really asking for you is for you to save us in your own way, in your own time, in your own space. We trust you completely to know what's best for us, and we give up our own will of trying to fix things in our lives. We don't want your signet ring. We want your salvation, pure and simple. We ask right now that you would dethrone us and take charge over our salvation and take charge over our sanctification and give us a new life in your spirit. We ask it in Jesus' holy name. Amen.